Good morning and welcome to Discover Christian Church. Our mission is to love God, love people, and impact the world. Glad you're with us this morning, uh, whether you're joining us here in the building or you are online. Uh, it's a great time to be worshiping God. And uh, we are in the final two weeks of One at a Time. And today and next week, we're just going to talk about two uh, concepts that are very practical, um, ways that we can get connected with people. So one of those, next week, Dane is going to be talking to us about one meal at a time. And today we're going to talk about one party at a time. People like to celebrate. You know, parties and celebrations are part of every culture throughout time. For example, I don't know if you know this or not, but today is National Stick Out Your Tongue Day. It might even be International Stick Out Your Tongue Day. So you can participate in that if you choose to or not. It may have started by a doctor. I'm not sure, you know, stick out your tongue day, but yeah. Um, as you also know, today is Father's Day. And uh, we, we celebrate and honor the men who have been significant in our lives, including um, our Heavenly Father, for sure. And uh, guys, as you leave today, there'll be a, a gift for you. Um, all guys that are either 16 or 18, I don't remember which it is, so figure that out yourselves. But uh, we want you to, to be honored today. Today, we also remember this reality that even after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1963, until this date in 1965, there was still slavery in the United States. And so today, June 19th, or as it's compressed, it's called Juneteenth, um, the end of slavery in the U.S. is celebrated. Again, we just like to celebrate, and God likes to celebrate. You know, not only did God design us to celebrate, but God created days of celebration. So, so why do some people think that God is like a killjoy, that he's angry, and that he's uptight. I think part of that reason might be because sometimes Christians look like killjoys and they look angry and uptight. Guys, we should be the most joyful people, right? We really should. <clears throat> Listen, God said when, when Jesus came to the earth, like the, innate, the angels announced it to the shepherds, remember they said, this is good news of great what? Joy right? And the fruit of the Spirit, the first one is, that's listed, part of the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's listed right after that? Joy. Joy. We should be joyful, Jesus followers. Maybe we need a change of perspective. And we haven't done this for multiple years, partially because of the pandemic and all, but um, partially because you guys don't love it that much, but we're going to do it. And what I would like us to do to, to give us a change of perspective we're going to do that in a physical way. Some of you know what's coming. Some of you are like, oh, no. Um, what we're going to do is if you are able, you need to stand up in just a second, and you're going to switch seats, not just like scoot over one seat. We want you to move from one section to the next, like literally move to a totally different section. And for those of you that are far in the back, if you want, we would love for you to move up front because we feel like that's a great place to be. So in just a second, we're gonna play a video. You're gonna gather your stuff, like we're really doing this. Um, in 30, you'll have 30 seconds to switch seats, okay? And go to a totally different sec section and change your perspective. So everybody got your stuff? Ready, set, go. Let's change our perspective. Great job, everybody. So, 
wow, everything looks different. <laughs> so here's the thing. The kingdom of God is serious, right? It is. Salvation, uh, eternity, that's all serious stuff. But the kingdom of God is relational. Like we are designed to be connected to each other and to be connected to God. And the kingdom of God is festive. It really, really is. And we're going to look at some of those, uh, some examples to help us see that today. In the Bible, the word celebrate is used over 70 times. The word rejoice is used over 175 times. And the word joy is used over 200 times. Now, you may disagree, but I think it's fair to say that God is among many, many other things, I think God is a party planner. <laughs> Here's why. In Leviticus, where we all spend a lot of time studying. <laughs> by the way, do you know? Well, it doesn't matter. Okay. In Leviticus, chapter 23, God plans seven feasts, seven celebrations, seven festivals for the people. And let's just briefly look at those. Passover. Passover celebrates the fact that the angel of death passed over the homes of the Jewish people who, who put the blood of the lamb above their door. And we know that Jesus, John says, he is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus used two elements of the Passover to initiate what we call the Lord's Supper or communion, which we just celebrated and we do that every week along with people throughout the world. It is a remembrance, but it's a celebration. The Feast of Unleavened Bread follows Passover, and it lasts for seven days. And it celebrates Israel's liberation from slavery when they didn't have enough time to put leaven in the bread dough because they were leaving Egypt so quickly. And I used to think that leaven was yeast, and it's not exactly the same thing. Leaven is basically a sourdough bread starter. It's that concept. So you take this part, you put it in there, you mix it in. That's what leaven was. They didn't have the time to do all of that because, again, they were leaving Egypt quickly. So they, they celebrate by eating bread without leaven. First fruits is the first of three harvest feasts. So they have three harvest feasts that thank God for his provision, and it took place on the first day, follow me on this, it took place on the first day after the Sabbath, after the Passover. Okay, so you have the Passover, then you have the Sabbath that follows Passover, and then this feast, the first fruits, took place the day after that. So Sabbath was Saturday in the Jewish calendar, the first fruits was Sunday. So Passover, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he gets falsely accused and arrested and tried, and then on Friday he's executed, then Passover, then the day after that is first fruits. That's the day Jesus rose, which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he says Jesus is like the first fruits who is raised from the dead. That's kind of cool. Seven weeks or 50 days after first fruits is the second harvest celebration. And this is called the Feast of Weeks. It's also known as Pentecost, which we've heard probably before if you've been in the church for a while. That's the day the Holy Spirit arrived in a brand new way. That's the day the church began. That's the day 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord and were baptized. And it initiated a harvest of souls for Jesus that continues to this day. The Feast of Trumpets is kind of like an extended Sabbath day. Um, and we need to get back to that idea, by the way, that resting thing. We're actually going to talk about that in August. But this idea of um, the Feast of Trumpets is the extended Sabbath day, and, and you're not allowed to do your regular work. Like, you have to pause and you rest. It's also known as Rosh Hashanah, and this is when the people commemorate this feast with the, the blowing of trumpet blasts. And we know in Revelation it says when Jesus returns, there's going to be a trumpet blast. And our regular striving, our toiling, our work that gives us so much difficulty is going to end. And we will be with God in a new creation forever. 
The Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, is a sober ending to the Jewish New Year celebration, and it includes times of sacrifice and introspection and prayer. And originally, on this day, the people's sin was symbolically placed on a goat, which was called a scapegoat, which was led out of the city. And this, this goat symbolically paid for the sin of the people. Well, we know Jesus was led out of the city, and our sin was placed upon him as he hung on the cross. That's why in 1 John 2, 2, it says, Jesus himself is the sacrifice that atones. Again, day of atonement. He atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. That's a day to celebrate. And then the third and greatest harvest feast is called the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, which lasted for seven days. And the people would live in these temporary structures. They called them booths. And the reason they did that was they remembered God's provision as their ancestors wandered around in the desert for 40 years, that God was with them and God provided. And the tabernacle is where God's presence was for them. So the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. These seven feasts are ongoing, joyful celebrations that God planned. And again, they're all listed there for us in Leviticus chapter 23. But that's only the first part of God's party planning. That's not all of it. In, in Matthew 22, Jesus compares the kingdom of God to this fantastic wedding feast with lots of unexpected people who are invited to the party. In Luke 15, Jesus tells stories of three things that are lost and then found. And each time the thing that was lost is found, there's a what? There's a celebration. The people are excited. And Jesus also talks in that chapter about how when a person turns from being lost, they, they turn back to God, that there is a celebration in heaven that the angels participate in. In Revelation 19, it mentions that the, uh, the feast of the Lamb, the wedding feast, when all the people who have done that, who have returned to God, are going to be celebrating this remarkable meal as part of this joyful eternity in God's presence without suffering or disease or death. Now listen, if you don't think God likes to celebrate, you need to change your perspective and lean into the joy that God has for your life. And when we look at how this applies to our lives, we're going to continue to see God's heart. But first, let's look at why this is important. Because that reveals God's heart as well. So why? Well, James 1, and 25 says that when we read the Bible, we shouldn't walk away and ignore it. Like a person who looks in a mirror and then forgets what they look like. Instead, we should put it into practice. So whenever the Bible or the Holy Spirit speak to us, there should be some sort of of a thing that happens, some sort of response. And that might be something internally that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. It might be some sort of action that we're supposed to do. It might be both of those. But before we get to what we should do, that internal change or that action, we need to understand the why. Because when we know why something is important, then we are more motivated to be changed or more motivated to act. So why does God initiate these feasts, these celebrations? Why does God enjoy this idea of, of celebration and party? Well, here's why. Because every person is significant. Every person is important to God. Every person is created individually in God's image. Every person is valuable. Listen, God wants you to know that you are worth dying for. He wrote it down. He preserved it for hundreds and, and for thousands of years. He's made sure that you heard this. God loves you, and you need to know that. You need to know it personally. You need to know it experientially. And once you've experienced it and embraced it, the focus then shifts from you to others, from me to others. Because once you get it, you share it. See, God wants every person to know they're loved and can be forgiven. So how do you share that good news? That's what this series is about. It's one person at a time. You, listen, you don't have to stand on a street corner with a Bible yelling at people, you're going to hell without Jesus. In fact, I would encourage you, unless God directly, really clearly says to do that, maybe don't. 
Because you know who didn't do that? Jesus. Jesus did not do that. Instead, do what Jesus did. Connect with people, one person at a time, and care about them. And then, when the opportunity arises, yes, take one step towards Jesus together. In week seven of One at a Time, Kyle Eidelman shares Um, how parties can help build relationships with other people and bring joy to their lives and joy to our own lives. And with the right motives, I would say we should consider doing the three things that God did and still does. So those are go to parties, bring joy to parties, and throw parties. So first, go to parties. Not joking. Not joking. John chapter 2. It says, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. You know what that says? That says Jesus went to parties. When Jesus was invited to a wedding, this huge, like multi day event, he went. I would say if someone cares enough about you to invite you to a party or a gathering, if it's possible, care about them enough to go. And when you go, you can take Jesus with you, right? In fact, we have this thing going on this summer. There's this Jesus thing. You can take Jesus with you. There's a full-size version, and there's the pocket version that I have in my wallet, Um, Jesus wants to go with us wherever we are. And so we encourage you this summer to to do that. Take Jesus in in a physical way, represent that, and then take pictures and share that. This Tuesday night at uh, from 6 to 8 o'clock p.m. in Amberley Park in Dublin, there's going to be the park pop-in. It's part of our Summerama. So if you haven't picked up a Summerama bookmark or whatever you want to call it in the uh, lobby, do that. There's also information on the web about it. It's, these are just times for us to get together, to either just get together in fellowship or to go serve. This Tuesday, get together. Just have some fun. There's going to be a popcorn machine there. There's going to be some hiking available for you. You can play Frisbee, playground, just talk, whatever you want to do. Like Jesus, go to parties. And like Jesus, bring joy to parties. Like if you continue in this story, it says the wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him they had no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus said, my time has not yet come. But then his mother, like mothers do, she told the servants, just do whatever he tells you. So she totally respects what Jesus said, but she's also like, you know, just do whatever Jesus says to do. Moms, they're great. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for the ceremonial washing. So Jesus then respects his mother, right? She respected him, and then he respects her. And each of these jars could hold 20 to 30 gallons, and Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars have been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best till now. Bring joy to parties. Don't be a goof, don't get drunk, don't try to be the life of the party, but also don't be a party pooper, okay? Mary and Jesus both cared enough to help others enjoy the party, and they also wanted to make sure that the hosts were honored and appreciated. I think those are things we can do when we're at parties. So ask how you can help. Set up. Clean up, bring something, do what you can do to help others enjoy the party. 
And notice how Jesus did, Jesus did it in the background. It's pretty impressive. So go to parties, bring joy to parties, and third, throw parties. Throw parties. Now, to be fair, this is a lot easier for the people who are wired that way, right? They have the gift of hospitality. They love to be with people. Um, but listen, even if you don't have that, I think we should all still throw parties. Now, think about it. If you don't have the spiritual gift of generosity, which is a spiritual gift, does that mean God doesn't want you to give? Of course not. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 says, everyone should grow in the grace of giving. And I think in kind of a similar way, God wants us all to grow in the grace of connecting with people, relating to people one at a time, including through appropriate parties. Remember how Jesus lived in his daily life. He consistently met individuals where they were, one person at a time. And Jesus' daily life included the things that happened in his culture. So there were parties and remembrances and celebrations. And again, you can go back and read these verses that we briefly touched on earlier where God plans for and then participates in all kinds of celebrations. So here's an action point. I would love for all of us to do this. And this is not, I am not wired this way. I would love for each person to say, I will host, I will throw one party this summer. I'm going to do that. And you can do that for whoever. Um, maybe you do it for your neighbors, you know, the people around you that you know each other, but you really haven't hung out together. Maybe that would be a great thing to do. Or maybe you talk to like Scott Holohan from uh, who works with International Friendships, and you say, Scott, could I help host a party for some of the international students, 80% of whom never have, in, have gone into the home of somebody in the United States? Could I host something for them? I'll bet they'd figure out how you could. Talk to Kevin and Amy Ramsey from Columbus Relief and say, hey, could we do some kind of little party thing for the friends, for the campers uh, who you guys serve? Could, could we do something like that? I just want to do that. Or whatever it is. Um, host a backyard Bible bash. That's a kind of an opportunity for you to connect with people in your neighborhood. Even if you don't have kids, you can host a backyard Bible bash. Just, just say yes to that. Do it. And then see what God does through it. Now, there is another celebration happening today. Today is... National Eat and Oreo Day. It's National Eat and Oreo Day. It really is. So here's the thing. As you leave, if you're in the building, uh, everybody who is here, there are out in the lobby, um, there are Oreos. You have your own individual pack of Oreos. And if you're a gluten-free person, we bought some gluten-free Oreos for you too. So everybody should be able to hopefully enjoy some Oreos after the service on National Eat and Oreo Day. You know, parties and celebrations, they can be an opportunity to deepen our relationships with each other. So I would just encourage you, encourage myself to ask your Heavenly Father to guide you and to provide wisdom as you connect with people each day of the journey. On March 6th of this year, Sharon Alfonsi of CBS News shared a story about Jacob Smith. He's 15 years old. He has no depth perception, like it literally doesn't function for him. He also is four times the level of legal blindness. So what that means, they said, is this. He'd need that big E on top of the chart. He'd need that to be blown up four times its size to be able to read it from 20 feet. That's pretty amazing. This is more amazing. Jacob is what's called a free ride snow skier. What that means is on the competition days, his little brother, Preston, helps him hike to the top of the mountain. Not to get on the ski lift and go, because the ski lift doesn't go high enough. They go all the way to the top. And this legally blind kid has with him a radio. And his father somehow, like, 
calmly down at the base camp, looking up the mountain that his son guides him down the mountain. His father said, it's on me to make sure I don't let him down. I guide him through narrower chutes or to not go off a cliff. Jacob is not reckless. He knows his limitations. I think he has the ability to, scare, to ski anywhere on the mountain, but he's not going to try to do it by himself. He wants to be with somebody he trusts. When Jacob was asked how much he trusted his father, he replied, I mean enough to turn right when he tells me. On Father's Day, be sure you know your Heavenly Father's voice. He loves you, and he's going to guide you when you can't see clearly. You can trust him when he says, turn or stop or go forward. God loves you. God cares for you. God wants to celebrate life with you both now and into eternity. And if you've never said yes to being adopted as God's son or daughter, you can come up front or, or connect with us if you're online, and we will help you take those next steps. Your heavenly Father will meet you. And he has guided you to this point today. He's leading you individually, one person at a time, one step at a time. So trust his voice to take your next step toward Jesus. And when you do, there will be partying in heaven over you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for creating us for relationship and for caring enough that when we broke that relationship, you did everything necessary to restore it. Remind us to celebrate that reality with joy every day. To connect with the people around us. God, remind us that we can take our next step towards Jesus together as your Holy Spirit guides. Show us what that next step is. Empower us to take it and help us to remember that you take each step with us. We thank you and we honor you today, our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. There are people who will be up front who would love to talk with you and pray with you. And again, if you're online, you can connect with us. Um, right now, let's stand and continue to honor and praise our Heavenly Father.